Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's update on COVID-19 in North Carolina. As of today, we have 169,425 lab confirmed cases, 2,111 new cases reported since yesterday, 953 people in the hospital, and sadly, 2,741 people who have died. Our thoughts are with all of those mourning a loved one. Overnight, heavy rain in central North Carolina led to some swift water rescues. Unfortunately, there are reports of two children who were swept away in a car, and rescue crews continue an aggressive search to find them. We're thankful for our brave first responders who always leap into action during even the most treacherous times, and we pray these children will be found safely. On COVID, after a summer of hard work, We've seen North Carolina's key indicators for COVID-19 remain stable or even decrease in some cases. Our pause in phase two was necessary as students returned to school and college campuses. Now when our college and universities opened their campuses, we did see outbreaks and an increase in cases. Some colleges pivoted to full online learning and after several weeks of students back in the classroom, we've continued to see our statewide numbers stabilized. We're encouraged, but cautious. Stability isn't victory. The forest isn't as thick, but we're not out of the woods. Right now, I'll ask Dr. Mandy Cohen, our Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, to walk through the data. Dr. Cohen. Well, thank you, Governor. The past six months have been difficult, and the summer was no exception. Throughout June and in the beginning of July, we experienced our highest levels of community transmission, cases, and then hospitalizations. But thanks to the hard work of North Carolinians, especially with wearing face coverings, we saw those trends stabilize and begin to move downward. While the back-to-school season provided new opportunities for the virus to spread, and we did see outbreaks at our universities, our overall metrics show signs of stability. Your hard work is having an impact, and we must keep working together to continue this progress. Now, as a reminder, we look at a combination of trend metrics. We look at COVID-like syndromic cases, lab-confirmed cases, positive tests as a percentage of total tests and hospitalizations. No one metric can tell the full story of viral spread in North Carolina. Okay, so let's look at the graphs. This first graph looks at people who come to the emergency department with COVID-like symptoms. This is the most timely data we have and it's our earliest detection mechanism. Taking a look at the yellow line, you can see this trend has now been declining for over a month. That's an encouraging and very positive sign, although you can see that that trend remains high above its baseline. Next, we look at laboratory confirmed cases. This first graph gives you a look at the trajectory of new cases each day since we had our first case back in March. Focusing on that yellow line, you can see that our highest peak of new cases was back in mid-July, and then the trend had been decreasing. In mid-August, we saw an increase in new cases among 18 to 24-year-olds when colleges and universities opened. And while young adults are at less risk of severe illness or needing hospitalization, they can still spread the virus. So we're watching this trend really closely. But let's zoom in to get a better sense of the current picture. Okay, so now you're seeing lab confirmed cases just since July 1st. So on this graph, we again see that yellow line is highest back in mid-July when we had our peak of new cases. Then the yellow line trended downward. In mid-August, that line ticked up when the colleges reopen. You can then see the yellow line floats back down and our cases are stabilizing over the past 14 days but our new cases remain at a, high, at a level that is too high. Today, we have over 2,000 new cases. 
So whether you are a college student or not, we need us all to focus on the three W's and slowing the spread of the virus. Okay, now we look at the, at the percent of tests that are positive. Looking at the yellow line, you can see that that percent of total tests that are positive has remained stable. While stability is a positive sign, I still wanna see these numbers down to 5% or less. Next, for hospitalization from COVID, you can see that the yellow line is trending down, which is a positive sign. Our hospitalization numbers have been on the decline since they peaked in late July. And while we still have an elevated level of hospitalizations, we continue to have sufficient hospital capacity. Okay, so here's where we are. Our surveillance data is declining, though it remains elevated, so it gets a yellow line. North Carolina's trajectory of lab-confirmed cases is stable, but the number of cases per day remains high, so it gets a yellow line. North Carolina's trajectory in percent of tests returning positive is stable. Again, gets a yellow line as we'd like to see this number at 5% or below. And then North Carolina's trajectory of hospitalization is declining, but is still elevated, and we continue to have enough hospital capacity. This also gets a yellow line. Now to our capacity indicators. You'll notice testing gets a sideward, sideways arrow. We have testing capacity in our state and people are getting test results faster, averaging about two days. However, fewer people are getting tested. So I wanna remind folks that anyone who has symptoms or, has, or thinks they may have been exposed should get tested. There are supports available to help people who may face challenges in being able to miss work or safely stay at home. For contact tracing, we continue to hire contact tracers to bolster the efforts of our local health department and our PPE supplies remain stable and we continue to distribute PPE across the state. So as we've taken steps forward, as we are going to take some steps forward today, it's important to remember that moving forward doesn't mean letting up. It's the actions of all of us that have gotten us to this point, but letting up in those preventative actions, especially the three W's, could erase all that progress. Later this week, I'll share our new public health campaign that will share why North Carolinians are getting behind the mass. So stay tuned on Thursday. And as flu season approaches, there's another preventive measure I'm gonna urge all North Carolinians to do, and that's get your flu shot. Flu can be serious, sometimes deadly, and this year, with another dangerous respiratory virus spreading at the same time and our medical system already working overtime, it's more important than ever to avoid getting sick, avoid getting sick by getting your flu vaccine. The unfortunate truth is that this pandemic is not yet over. While we're all forced, forced, forced to live alongside this virus, we can all take simple actions that will allow us to keep taking steps to protect our communities, reignite the economy, and getting back to the things we love. Those actions are the three W's, wearing a face covering over your nose and mouth, waiting six feet apart, and washing your hands often. That's wear, wait, and wash. Thank you, Governor. Thanks so much, Dr. Cohen. I appreciate your leadership. We're encouraged to see North Carolina holding steady on most and decreasing on some of our key data metrics. North Carolinians, most of you are showing you know how to fight this disease, and most of you should be proud of yourselves. Remember, every time you wear your mask or social distance, you're helping our statewide numbers so we can ease restrictions. You're protecting people, known and unknown. You're saving lives and you're slowing the spread of this virus. Because of our stable numbers, today we're ready to take a careful step forward. North Carolina will move into Safer at Home Phase 2.5 beginning this Friday, September the 4th at 5 p.m. Here's what'll happen. First, our at-risk population is still safer at home. For those over 65 and those with health risk, we urge responsibility in your choices. The limits on mass gatherings will increase 
to 25 people indoors and 50 people outdoors. Playgrounds will be allowed to open. Museums and aquariums can open at 50% capacity. Gyms and other indoor exercise facilities can open at 30% capacity. The age requirement for mask wearing will include children down to age five. Capacity limits at restaurants and personal care businesses like hair and nail salons will remain the same. For all of these, there will be additional safety measures required. Some places will remain closed, including bars, nightclubs, movie theaters, indoor entertainment, and amusement parks. And large venues will still be subject to the mass gathering limits. We know that big gatherings are among the most dangerous settings for transmission of this deadly disease. Also, as we announced yesterday, the 11 p.m. curfew on alcohol sales at restaurants has been extended to October the 2nd. Safer at Home Phase 2.5 continues our state's dimmer switch approach to easing some restrictions. I want to be clear. We can do this safely only if we keep doing what we know works, wearing masks and social distancing. Moving to phase 2.5 means that we can safely do a few more things while still fighting the virus as vigorously as ever. In fact, a new phase is exactly when we need to take this virus even more seriously. Wear a face mask, wash your hands, make sure that you're waiting six feet apart. These things have never been more important. And until we have a vaccine or a reliable cure, the precautions like the three W's are with us for a while. Life may look a little different these days, but every time we wear a mask, we help our economy by slowing the spread. We make it safer to visit our favorite stores and restaurants and other businesses. Wearing a mask is an easy way to look out for people. I've seen the tremendous things that North Carolinians will do to take care of each other. After a storm, a flood, even an earthquake or a local crisis, a mask, that's not hard at all compared to the links I've seen North Carolinians go to help each other. So let's keep doing what we know works. Let's stay strong and let's beat this virus. I know we can and I know that we can come out stronger on the other side. Along with Secretary Cohen, also with me today is our Secretary of Public Safety, Eric Hooks, and our Emergency Management Director, Mike Sprayberry. Jennifer Boyd and Brian Tipton are our sign language interpreters. And behind the scenes, Jackie and Jasmine Mativier are our Spanish language interpreters. Uh, we will now take questions from the media. And if you can make sure you identify yourself and the organization you represent, we would appreciate it. And we'll take our first question. Our first question is from Gary Robertson with the Associated Press. Hey, Governor, it's Gary Robertson. Um, on uh, a, not a tangential topic, but obviously the legislature is coming back tomorrow, and uh, you may have seen bits and pieces now of the uh, package, the COVID relief package that they have, which would include giving about $300 to each family in direct payments and also expanding eligibility for opportunity scholarships. I wanted to know what you thought about the package, given what you know about it, and whether you have concerns or support for it. Thank you. I haven't seen anything at all about it, Gary. I understand they unveiled it this afternoon. We will read it very carefully. We want to keep the health and safety of North Carolinians as the first priority, and we'll certainly work with them as the process goes along. I hope that they will continue to look at the budget that I presented. We'll certainly look at what they have presented this afternoon, and hopefully we can come up with a package that will be positive for North Carolina. Next question, please. Our next question is from Kenny Beck with WXII. Good afternoon, Governor. Kenny Beck, WXII. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Dr. Cohen referenced the fact that there was 
little bit of a surge, a spike in cases in mid-August, particularly among younger people with back-to-college season. I'm curious, is she and are you anticipating another spike once we enter phase 2.5 starting on Friday? Well, first, one of the reasons that we paused in phase two was the fact that we knew that our public schools, K through 12, and our colleges and universities were opening. And we anticipated some virus spread. If we continue doing what we need to do with wearing a mask and social distancing and washing our hands, uh, these careful movements forward should not affect the viral spread because we know that uh, it's going to be important for people to keep working hard. And we've taken some two, a few steps here to continue with our dimmer switch approach. Uh, we know that as we go into the fall and winter, it will get colder. And Dr. Cohen reminded you about the flu shot. It's gonna be important for people to look after each other and to take these steps to protect each other. We're, we're, we believe that things can continue to improve. Uh, we wanna drive those numbers down and I think we can do that doing the things we know that work. Dr. Cohen, would you wanna add something? Okay. Next question, please. Our next question is from Ruben Jones with Spectrum News. Governor, good afternoon. This is Ruben Jones from Spectrum News in Charlotte. Can you elaborate on how you reach that 30% capacity for gyms and what is your message to bar owners who um, are now going on, as you say, about six months of not being able to open what their future is uh, as they move forward here? Thank you. First, we know that uh, places where you do exercise indoors that the virus can be spread and it's one of the reasons that uh, capacity was limited to 30% and I, I'll let Dr. Cohen uh, explain a little bit about how they came to that. Uh, we know that some businesses are still closed and that people are hurting. And the more we can do to slow the spread of this virus, the faster we can turn this dimmer switch on and, and let everything open. Uh, the problem is if people don't do things to slow the spread, like wearing a mask and social distancing, we're going to continue to have to be careful. I know we're working hard to do things to boost the economy, to put money uh, in place to help small businesses. I know the federal relief package has done that. We've worked hard to provide unemployment benefits. But I think the thing that I want everybody to do is to work hard so that all of these businesses can be open. Dr. Cohen, would you like to say a word or two about uh, the gyms? Well, thanks, Ruben. So important to know that the activities that we are easing restrictions on today, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had safety protocols in place because these are activities that have the chance of more viral spread. We've talked about before how gyms are places where folks are breathing heavier and then are thus expelling more viral respiratory droplets and it's just a higher likelihood that virus could spread. So we felt we wanted to be more restrictive than we had been say with some of our restaurants or retail that are at 50% capacity. We wanted to be a bit more restrictive so we said 30% capacity. But I wanted to take the opportunity to remind folks that just because we're easing restrictions on gyms does not mean that's the right choice for everyone. I want to remind folks to think about their own personal health risk or their family's health risk. We know that more than half of adults in North Carolina have at least one chronic disease that puts them at higher risk for severe illness from COVID. So I would say to make sure that you are thinking about do you have underlying asthma or diabetes um, or high blood pressure 
Is someone in your family fighting off cancer? Are you over 65? Those are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about when you make decisions about doing any higher risk activity. Gyms is one of them. Um, but of course, we want everyone to be taking the precautions they need. I think if we all continue to focus, as the governor said, on the three W's, we can continue to make progress while easing restrictions on some of these higher risk for viral spread activities. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Derek Dellinger with Fox 46. Thank you for taking my question. I actually have two questions, uh, both of which would either be for the governor or for Dr. Cohen if either one wants to answer this. Uh, the metrics aren't exactly where everyone wants them to be, and even Dr. Cohen said this. Why go into phase 2.5 right now first? Second question uh, has to do with some of the things that we've gotten uh, as of actually a couple of hours ago from the White House. Uh, some officials are saying that they are advising uh, college presidents in the states that do have outbreaks, uh, at least on their campuses, uh, to keep the COVID affected students on campus or risk another major outbreak when they, whenever they go back home. What is your reasoning here as far as uh, the conversations that you're having with uh, university officials? Uh, as to how they are going to be managing their outbreaks and how that they are going to be keeping students safe. As to why we want to move to phase 2.5, first, the numbers are stable and some of them are declining. So there, that's positive. We also want to do things to spur our economy, to encourage people to exercise at the same time. So this is a dimmer switch careful step that we're making that we hope we can continue to keep the decline moving downward and still be able to turn the dimmer switch up and we believe that that can work we want our students and our faculty and their families all to be safe on campuses and i'll let dr cohen address that issue Thank you. So on the first issue, um, I want to remind folks that you need to look at all of the metrics uh, that we consider as we make decisions. Um, as, and as I went through earlier, if we look at four metrics, um, we, and we see some positive signs in those, particularly in our early surveillance data. The fact that that has had a steady and, and decline for over a month is a very encouraging and positive sign. The fact that our hospitalizations are declining, that is a very positive sign. The fact that our percent of tests that are positive has been very steady um, is a positive sign. I think we do need to watch our cases closely, um, and it speaks to your second question about our university campuses. I think we need to work um, with, uh, with our universities, and I know they are working hard to step up the, the work to both enforce the executive orders on and off their campus. Um, as far as keeping students on campus if they're positive, that is very much in line with our guidance. When we work with our institutes of higher education, one of the things that I've articulated to them personally myself is about having students who are positive or are exposed staying on campus. We want to make sure that virus um, is able to be contained and that it doesn't go into the community. Now, if a, a student and, and family does want to take their student home, we understand that, but then we want to make sure that they, are, they know the risks and are taking all of the precautions that they need to. We don't want a student to go home to their family, back to their parents who are older, may have chronic conditions, spread the virus there and get, get their home sick or their community sick. So we are very much in line with the guidance uh, that was articulated about wanting to keep students who are positive on campus until they're able to be uh, well uh, again, so in order to contain the virus. Thank you. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Rebecca Martinez with WUNC. Hello, Governor. It's Rebecca Martinez from WUNC. Uh, the North Carolina Supreme Court is considering a lawsuit by owners of bowling alleys who say they should be allowed to reopen. Are they being allowed to reopen under Phase 2.5? Yes, they are allowed to be open under Phase 2.5 with certain restrictions and 30% uh, capacity. 
and uh, th this is part of the indoor exercise uh, movement forward that we're making with this phase 2.5. Next question, please. Follow-up, Rebecca Martinez, WUNC. Thank you. It's Rebecca again. Uh, this is a question for Secretary Dr. Cohen. Um, I understand that the number of children who've been diagnosed with MASC has risen to 25. I'm wondering, how are those cases being um, tested or diagnosed? Uh, what, what screening information should families with kids who have COVID-19 uh, bear in mind? Rebecca, thanks for that question. First, I want to say that this multi-inflammatory system in children that we are seeing related to COVID is very, very rare. As you're saying, 25 cases in this entire time, time period. Um, so I want parents to be assured that it's a very rare um, outcome. And, but what we want to be sure is that when your child is having symptoms of fever or cough um, or having any unusual symptoms that to get in touch with your pediatrician because it is the pediatrician working closely with our department where we go through a criteria to understand could this be that multi-system inflammatory disease. Um, and again, very rare, something we work through with pediatricians and our public health experts. What I would say to any parent who is concerned about their child's health, make sure to get in touch with your pediatrician as a first step. Thanks. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Lucille Sherman with the News and Observer. Hi, Governor. This is Lucille Sherman with the NNO. Thanks for taking my question. Um, if the number of cases, new cases every day is still too high, but you don't expect a new spike in phase 2.5, why didn't you open gyms earlier, um, maybe with a reduced capacity even lower than 30%? Because our numbers had been stable or declining, depending on which metric that you looked at, for quite a period of time, and in keeping with our dimmer switch approach, we thought that it was time to go ahead and move toward this. We think it's positive movement. We think it can help to boost our economy in a safe way. And we believe that uh, we had put like six, week, six weeks on this last order, and we felt like that we, we were at a point where we could go ahead and do what we were planning to do and make it effective as of this Friday. Next question, please. Follow-up, Lucille Sherman, News and Observer. Thanks. I've noticed quite a few gyms opened sort of despite the orders anyway. Why not invest more time in enforcement of that if many gyms were opening before you allowed them to open with this order? Well, first, a lot of businesses are obeying the law, and we appreciate that. Uh, one of the exceptions that allowed gyms to open, even under the previous order, was having uh, the doctor approve exercise at an indoor gym for one of their customers. So a number of gyms were open to handle that traffic of people who were getting uh, notes from their doctors. So some of them were open. But we expect the businesses to obey the rules. I think this is important not only for their customers, but for their own staff to make sure that they obey these rules. And we expect that they will going forward. Next question, please. Our next question is from Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal. Yes, uh, hello, Governor. This is Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal. Uh, with the Phase 2.5 opening, you're talking about opening playgrounds. How does this affect both, I guess, college athletics and, I guess, club and high school athletics? Is this going to be a situation where if people are going to be allowed to gather in numbers of 50 outdoors, does that basically permit um, sports events like football, soccer, um, anything outdoors of that nature? We've made recommendations to both uh, colleges and the North Carolina High School Athletic Association that have made decisions about sports going forward. 
uh, the crowd limitations would be the same for both. But Dr. Cohen, I know, has worked uh, with both of those. And would you like to expound on that, Dr. Cohen? Hi, Richard. So nothing in this new movement to phase 2.5 changes anything related to athletics. Uh, currently, we have recommendations for um, athletics to say, particularly for college and youth sports, um, to not have any contact sports. That is our recommendation. Um, what the governor was mentioning is ha in terms of spectators at those sports. So if you were having, for example, a tennis match, um, which is a non-contact sport, um, you can now, according to mass gathering rules that have now just been extended, could have up to 50 people at, uh, uh, you know, as long as they were social distance, hopefully we're wearing masks, um, could be outdoors uh, watching something like that. Um, again, for professional sports, for collegiate division one, two, and three sports, they are governed by different uh, regulatory bodies, um, and we have worked closely with them on, on those uh, guidances. But for our guidance, uh, that impacts high High school sports and youth sports, we continue to say no uh, to recommend no contact sports. But now, uh, because of mass gathering limits, you can have spectators at those non-contact sports. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Follow up, Richard Crafer, Winston Salem Journal. Yes. Uh, um, Secretary Cohen, let me give you a specific example and see if this might um, help answer my question. Say you're, you're talking about a sport, um, say like soccer, and there's a specific number of, like if you're talking about 17, 18 year old players, and there may be 18 to 20 players on a team. And then by the time you add coaches in or in referees and things like that, you probably are getting pretty close to that 50 number. So in that instance, is there an ability to have spectators actually be at the events if you're already approaching 50 just from the participants? Thanks for that. Yes, we have considered the folks who are playing on the field different from the spectators um, so that, that you wouldn't have to count the players against the spectators. But I think more importantly, is the example you gave for, for soccer, it is a contact sport. Um, so that would be high school contact sports, which again, we, we are saying that we do not recommend those at this time, particularly since we're seeing the vast majority of our schools and our high schools aren't even having in-person instruction. I know the High School Athletic Association Association, which govern this, has already postponed uh, the sporting events for, um, for those contact sports. And so, again, the more progress we can make here with our numbers, right, as we drive our virus level lower, that means more kids are going to go back to in-person instruction. Again, they're already able to do that, but school districts have chosen to do online uh, instruction. We, we envision more kids will be back in the classroom, and then we can think about what, what should we do related to high school sports. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Travis Fain with WRAL. Hi, Travis Fain, WRAL. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to get two in, if I could. First, the FDA has approved some quick testing strips that look like they're going to be cheap uh, and look like they're going to produce results very quickly. Uh, are we ordering those so that – when will we start to see those uh, impact us here in North Carolina? And also on the nursing home change, it, I just want to be clear, you, are, you this is the first time since March we're allowing visits at, at nursing homes, but they have to be outdoors. I want to make sure I'm understanding that correctly. And then also ask why not allow group activities at those homes uh, if they can be outdoors and socially distanced. That's the way I read the order, that it allows visits, but not the group activities. Thank you for that question. First, we want more testing uh, if it is affected, and these quicker tests can be used for certain things like screening, which we think could be a positive thing, and I'll let Dr. Cohen talk about the specifics of that. Uh, as to uh, nursing home visitation, we know that this separation has been so hard for families. We also know that it's important to protect nursing home residents and staff from the virus. 
And I think Dr. Cohen will step up and outline to you uh, very specific steps that would be taken for outside visitation in order for people to be able to see each other in a safe way. And uh, I'll let Dr. Cohen address both of those issues. Hi, Travis. I think you were referring to the new Abbott uh, rapid tests that were just approved last week. Uh, what we are understanding is actually the federal government has bought up the supply for the next several months of the Abbott test, but they are sharing with us that they're going to be um, allocating those to the states. We're trying to still get more information on how is that allocation going to work, how many is coming, and then how would we distribute that here within North Carolina. So I think still a lot more to learn there. And again, another tool in our tool belt uh, in terms of testing, as the governor said, we want to increase testing. If we can get faster, rapid results that are accurate, that is a good thing. But I think uh, still want to do some more understanding of, of what is actually going to come here to North Carolina and then how do we distribute those. Those tests still need to be administered by a healthcare professional in a lab setting. So we do need to work out logistics of who's going to get, get what here in, in North Carolina. So stay tuned as we learn more from the federal government on that. Uh, and as far as skilled nursing facilities, you are right that we are moving forward with outdoor visitations at this point. We were allowing outdoor visitations for other long-term care facilities, um, but we had not allowed that yet at skilled nursing facilities. As you know, those are folks who are our most medically frail, um, and we've been working very, very hard to protect them at this very, very challenging time. We know that this virus can attack those who are medically frail and be very severe. Um, so we've been trying to find this balance of protection, but also recognizing that this visitation is part of, 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 of leading a full and complete life. And so um, we are trying to find that balance here with allowing for outdoor visitation. And I think we want to take this one step at a time. Um, so we want to facilitate these outdoor visits with, with families. We interact with advocates and families and the, in, uh, the facilities all the time. And then we hope to be able to think about what could we do next. But let's take one step at a time to make sure we can continue to keep the residents of our skilled nursing facilities safe and to keep the virus out of those settings. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Christy O'Connor with WBTV. Hi, Governor. This is Christy O'Connor from WBTV in Charlotte. Um, there are a lot of boutique fitness studios in this area in which they would be classes that wouldn't have more than 25 people indoors. I was wondering for these specific studios, would they be allowed to operate as long as they stayed under that indoor mass gathering of 25 people? Or would they too have to operate at 30% capacity, meaning only seven or eight people in that class? would have to operate at certain restrictions, but I'll let Dr. Cohen address that. Hi there. This is going to depend on the physical layout of some of these dance studios or yoga studios or other um, indoor fitness. So I would say we should follow up offline with our teams in, in our guidance, our specifics around what does 30% mean. Sometimes that has to do with the fire code capacity. Sometimes that has to do with number of people for, for the given space. So it would depend on, um, uh, on, on the particular physical layout. What I would encourage folks to do is, is for those kinds of indoor group activities, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to space out, right? You're going to want to have extra space between folks. So operating at maximum capacity uh, is, is not what we want here. We want folks to take the precautions that they need, keep each other safe, um, and make sure that we are, are all making good decisions personally. Again, just because we are opening uh, 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 gyms and indoor fitness, that might not be right for everyone. So again, I encourage folks to think about their own personal health risk, their family's risk, in terms of how they're making decisions about um, what to participate in. Thanks. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Kate Martin with Carolina Public Press. Good afternoon, Governor. This is Kate Martin with Carolina Public Press. On the streets of many college towns around the state, groups of students are congregating in party buses where they drink alcohol in close proximity without masks. 
Is this legal under the state's current executive orders? And if so, why? Well, first, uh, the mass gathering limitation would apply to college students, whether they are on or off campus, and we want to discourage that. Secondly, we want uh, people to be wearing masks and to be social distanced. And in order to do that, uh, it'll help us slow the spread of the virus. And we are encouraging our college campuses, those leaders, as well as local law enforcement uh, in those college towns to enforce these orders. We think it's probably more important than ever that they do enforce these orders in order to slow the spread. Would you want to add anything to that? Next question, please. Follow-up, Kate Martin, Carolina Public Press. Hi, Governor. With all due respect, you didn't really answer the question as to whether the party buses are legal or not under the current executive order. Thank you. So it would depend on how many people are there, whether they were wearing masks, whether they were social distancing. Uh, we want them to abide by the mass gathering limits. Uh, there may be local ordinances on whether you ought to have alcohol in a certain place. It would depend on the specific circumstances. Next question, please. Our final question today is from Eric Spanberg with the Charlotte Business Journal. Governor, it's Eric Spanberg in Charlotte. Uh, you went over some of the crowd limits uh, and uh, some of the youth and high school sports Dr. Cohen did. I'm curious, this week the Carolina Panthers announced they would not be able to have fans uh, at the home opener next week. Uh, for college and professional spectator sports, what specific criteria does your administration have in mind to determine when it will be safe for spectators to attend sporting events again? So you're looking at a big sports fan right here. I love sports. I want people eventually to be able to get back into stadiums and auditoriums and cheering their teams on. We also know that uh, one of the ways that this virus spreads so rapidly is when people get together. So the idea is right now that even though uh, these teams can allow, be allowed to play and the referees and whatever support staff that, need, uh, that are needed for the teams to be able to play, we are going to keep the fans to the mass gathering limit in order to be able to slow the spread of the virus. We're going to have to look at our trends and indicators as we go along to determine uh, when uh, that might be possible. I know that uh, in most of the NFL teams right now are saying no fans for their first few games. That's prudent. And so we're, we're hoping that as we make these decisions going forward, that we can continue to do those things that we need to do with wearing face coverings and social distancing and washing hands in order to drive the virus spread down so that we can do more of that. Thank you all for being with us today and stay safe out there, everybody.